Stillness Flowing, The Life and Teachings of Ajahn Chah by Ajahn Jayasaro, narrated by Gosaka. Chapter 11 Ice in the Sun Luang Po's Waning Years Part 2. More to it. Reflections In February 1941, the 82-year-old Arahant Lung Bu Sao, teacher and companion of Lung Bu Man, arrived by boat at a small riverside temple in Jampasak, southwest Laos. He had fallen ill some time before leaving Thailand. Now, on his way back to Thailand from an exhausting trip, he had spent the long journey upstream, lying down with his eyes closed, apparently unconscious and clearly close to death. As the boat tied up at the jetty, he opened his eyes and asked, Have we arrived? Take me to the Uposata Hall. His disciples half led, half carried him into the building. Once inside, he somehow managed to pull himself into a sitting posture and asked for his outer robe to be folded over his left shoulder. He began to meditate. After a few minutes had passed, he came out of the cross-legged posture in order to bow three times to the large Buddha statue in front of him. After a while, his disciples realized that he had not moved for some time. They rushed over, checked for breath on a small mirror, and found none. Lung Bu Sao had passed away, while prostrating before the Buddha. To a Buddhist, Lung Bu Sao's death is deeply inspiring. Many arahants from the time of the Buddha onwards have left the world in similarly uplifting ways. Some, like Venerable Ananda, even gracing their departure with a display of psychic powers. But this has never been the norm. Indeed, Venerable Mahamogalana, one of the Buddha's two chief disciples, died at the hands of a group of brigands who pounded his bones until they were as small as grains of rice. In the modern period, two of Lung Bu Man's most revered disciples died in a plane crash, and some years later, another came to his end in a car accident. Countless others have died after painful illnesses. These examples make it clear that enlightenment gives no automatic protection from protracted illness or violent death. In their final lifetime, arahants must work through any unresolved gamma committed in previous lives. This was true of the Buddha himself. He linked the injury he sustained when a rock was thrown down at him from a mountain by his evil cousin to old gamma. Over and above the more measurable physical factors leading to Luang Por's last years of illness, his disciples have always considered gamma to be the culprit in chief. He himself, as mentioned earlier, viewed it in that way. The unresolved question, drawn into sharp relief by the development of medical technologies, is how far the care of one believed to be an arahant should be taken. How far, in other words, should medical intervention be permitted to play a part in the working out of the arahant's gamma? Many disciples of Luang Por particularly the generation that could remember his early opposition to modern medical care, were uneasy about the extent of the treatment he received. Their views were summed up by Lung Dama Habua, the great disciple of Lung Bu Man, in his customarily fiery manner. Me and Ajahn Chah, we know each other well. We respect each other very much, and I don't want to hear that he's been imprisoned and hooked up with wires. Doing that to a monk of his stature, it's completely inappropriate. Listen to me, it's completely inappropriate. To put it simply, you're completely smothering him with the world. The Dhamma in his heart is bright, radiant, immeasurable, and it's unable to manifest. There's nothing but worldly things enveloping him. It looks repulsive. If he says he can't carry on, then let his body go accordingly. That's my opinion. 
but Long Paul's own expressed wishes on the matter were ambiguous. He had said different things at different times in different contexts. The period when his brain condition caused him to say exactly the opposite of what he meant to say stuck in everyone's mind and complicated matters. After he stopped talking, it was hard for anyone to be really sure about his intentions. There were periods when he was unwilling to take food and did everything in his very limited power to avoid doing so. To some of Lung Po's disciples, this was a clear indication that he did not want to carry on living in the state he was in and desired to be left to die in peace. To others, it was merely a symptom of his illness. They pointed out that when they persevered or pleaded for Lung Po's cooperation, he invariably complied. To which would come the retort, of course he did, what choice did he have, and so on. Only one thing was indisputably clear. All of Lung Po's disciples were united by the same wish to do the right thing. It just was not always so easy determining what that right thing was. As for the doctors, they considered it to be both their ethical and legal duty to offer every available treatment. To fail to do so would have been criminally negligent. Furthermore, the gumma that might be incurred by them allowing an arahant to die unnecessarily was a truly frightening prospect. On a more worldly level, the doctors were aware that any mistakes they might make in the care of such a universally loved figure would deal a crushing blow to their professional reputations. Also of considerable weight were the wishes of the Queen. She was in favour of pursuing every available avenue to extend Lung Po's life. Perhaps the most telling testimony is that of Ajahn Liam, Lung Po's Dhamma heir at Wat Bapong. He was adamant that Luang Po could always understand him throughout his illness and used his eyes to indicate ascent and descent. He said that at Chulalongkorn Hospital, Luang Po had no wish to live on. But we couldn't let him go. Another dimension. Whatever the case, most of Luang Po's disciples took as their refuge the belief that he had finished his work and had gone beyond all mental suffering. They learnt to see the decay of his physical body as perhaps their greatest teacher of the truths of old age, sickness and death. Even silent and bedridden, Lung Po provided them with profound teachings on impermanence, suffering and not-self. And Lung Po's physical condition was not the whole story by any means. While his body might be seen and reflected upon by anybody with a good pair of eyes, the state of his mind remained invisible to all but the most gifted meditators. But every now and again, unusual events occurred that reminded everyone that Luang Po was no ordinary patient. One of the first of these occasions occurred when, just prior to the day of the Queen's visit in 1983, a four-man army security team arrived in the monastery. Monks watched them with some amusement as they searched for weapon stashes and landmines. One soldier carried a large radio pack on his back and checked radio communication links sector by sector. On reaching the nursing kuti, the attendants asked the soldiers to take off their boots. The soldiers ignored them and conducted their search, showing scant respect for the old sick master they found in the inner room. Once outside, the radio operator tried to make contact with headquarters. He was surprised to find the radio dead. The soldiers walked back towards the main gate, and as they did so, the radio began to work again. However, on their return to the nursing kuti, it went dead once more. The puzzled soldiers asked the attendant monks if there was some magnetic field around the kuti. The monks said that they did not think so. The soldiers started to become anxious. If they did not radio their HQ from these coordinates in the next few minutes, they would get into trouble. One of the attendants offered a suggestion. He said that the way they had burst into the kuti earlier had seemed very rude and disrespectful. They should take off their boots, bow to Luang Po and ask for his forgiveness. With some reluctance, the soldiers agreed. At the very moment their heads touched the floor, 
the radio squawked loudly and came back to life. White-faced, the soldiers asked for forgiveness with genuine feeling. Another event witnessed by Ajahn Nyanadamo occurred during the crisis of 1987. Long Po was in the intensive care unit at Ubon Hospital and looked certain to die. Ajahn Liam was already preparing the funeral arrangements. Long Po was on oxygen and lying there very still. The doctors checked the oxygen intake and they could find no measurable breath. They took the mouthpiece off, shook the gauge thinking there was something wrong with it. They tried it on another patient and it was working normally. But when they put it back on Lung Po, they could still find no measurable breath. They began to worry that he might be brain dead. They took a blood sample and were amazed to find that the oxygen level was completely normal. They said to Ajahn Liam, this just doesn't make sense. He's not breathing, there's no measurable pulse, and yet the oxygen level in his brain is normal. Ajahn Liam just said, he's entered jhana. But most moving to the attendant monks were the words of Luang Po's great contemporaries who visited him at the nursing kuti. On one occasion, Ajahn Put, the most well-known living disciple of Luang Po Sao, asked for some private time to meditate by Luang Po's bedside. On emerging from the room, he said to the monks present, Luang Po's mind is like the full moon. It's very radiant. His mind is peaceful and still at all times. But when he is offered food or someone attends on him, he is aware at every moment. He knows everything that's going on. Silver Linings That Luang Po's death was preceded by a long illness could not in any sense be labelled a blessing in disguise. It did nevertheless lead to a number of long-lasting benefits to the Wat Bapong Sangha. Firstly, it provided a long period during which the Sangha was able to learn how to adapt to life without him as a leader, but with him still present as a uniting figurehead. Rather than disintegrate, the Sangha grew, an unprecedented development for a forest monastery that had lost its teacher. During the period of Luang Po's illness, the number of branch monasteries increased by almost a hundred. Secondly, the huge long-term commitment necessary to sustain the quality of Luang Po's nursing care brought the Sangha together. Friendships were forged between monks from different monasteries on shared nursing shifts that stood the test of time. This complex web of relationships that developed further enhanced the harmony and sense of brotherhood for which the Wat Ba Pong Sangha was already renowned. The monks who served Luang Po benefited from the opportunity to express their gratitude and devotion to him, as did the Mer Chis who prepared his special diet every day. The attendants learned geriatric nursing techniques that were to be of great use in the coming years as more and more of the senior disciples entered their old age. The huge number of visitors over the years gained the immeasurably good comer of paying respects to a noble being. All of these benefits were, without doubt, considerable silver linings. And yet, for many, they could not conceal the cloud of regret that Luang Po's life of training and teaching his disciples should have come to such an early end at the age of 64.